the air and everything. Techno, techno music opening. That's so exciting. Does it show up on the screen? Does it look good? You can see my desktop. My desktop consists mostly of headshots of myself, which is bad because I have a huge ego, and then AI-generated headshots of myself with actual hair. This is uh, the AI of me as an astronaut, apparently. Cool. Um, we're very excited that you all are here, and I'm very happy to be opening up um, f the festival today. Uh, this is pretty exciting stuff. I will admit I am a little bit jet-lagged. My son and I came here uh, just yesterday uh, in the middle seat in coach uh, and uh, got in about 2 o'clock yesterday. And then we had that whole argument, if you've ever flown east where you want to go to sleep right now. And I was like, no, we have to stay up until at least 8 o'clock. And somewhere around 6 o'clock, I think we were both pretty much out. So now mistakes were made. Um, but it's all good. All right, friends. So um, my name is Scott Hanselman, and uh, this is me. And uh, yesterday, while I was on the plane, I got a notification that I was promoted at work to vice president of developer community at Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is a really, thank you very much, which is a very, oh, hey. Did I break it? Disappeared. So now I have a guy who tells me I need to shave, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> he said it's the beard. Lose the beard is the, is the feedback. That was the note that was just given. Um, so I got that. Um, and you know when someone gives you a compliment, you're supposed to just say thank you. But I think a lot of us go, oh, no, it's, you know, just, just sorry, it's nothing or whatever. So I'm re really trying to get used to that, uh, that validation after now 32 years in the software industry as a, as a developer. And um, so what I did is I went on a, the only, this is the way I dealt with it. The only thing that I knew how to do was go on a thank you tour. So I just started calling people that were really influential in my, in my life. Um, I went and I, you know, I tweeted about it and I went and I talked to um, my, my fifth grade English teacher who gave me an Apple II to use. And uh, that got me thinking about like how much stuff has changed in the time that I've been doing software. Uh, in 1985-ish, uh, we didn't have a computer lab at my school. There was simply a computer at the school. So one school equals one computer. And uh, I happened to be the one who wanted to play Oregon Trail, I guess, the most. So I was always on the computer. And my fifth grade uh, English teacher, Mrs. Hill, made a deal with the principal of the school and said that I could steal the computer on the weekends as long as it was back on Sunday night. Because there's only one computer, so she was literally sh giving me privileges no one, no one else had. She was taking a risk. And by steal the computer, I mean the computer is not allowed to leave the school. And I couldn't come to the school on the weekend and use the computer, so my dad would back his truck, we'd take this van and we'd back the van up against the school as tight as we could to make that kind of like heist exchange as you take the computer and then put it directly on the back of the, the van and then just take off as fast as you can and peel out. And then I would play on the computer, uh, you know, this Apple II all weekend and then I would return it on, on Sundays. And as a, you know, an 11-year-old, I didn't think anything of that, but I realized, though, later on, having the simple access of it, and then a person who said, you know, you've got moxie, kid. You could be a computer person. You know, I believe in you, is so huge. It's so fundamental to have someone who was kind and patient who gave me access. And this, this van that we had, I'm going to go out here and Google with Bing. It was a 1972 Ford... Econo line. There you go. Look like this. <clears throat> that was the van that we stole the computer in. And I came home once. My dad was a firefighter because in the US, all of our buildings are made of wood. <laughs> what could go wrong? Um, and my, my mom was a zookeeper. 
So she literally would shovel elephant shit and uh, as a job. It's a good, it's a righteous job. And she also made leather holders for um, birds of prey. So she was a zookeeper and he was a firefighter. And uh, I was the first one to go to, to university. And anyway, when I'm, when I'm 12 now, I show up to the house and the van is gone. Where's the van? Everything okay, right? And in the U.S., a lot of times in working class scenarios, having a car or having more than one car represents wealth. If you don't really have a bank account, you have extra cars, maybe on blocks or maybe in the back. And those are things that you, I could fix it up and I could sell it. So at any moment, that bank, that, 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 that represents wealth. So I said, where's the, where's the van? And they said, well, we sold it because your teacher said you should get a computer. They sold the van, and they bought me a Commodore 64. Yeah. Bought me a Commodore 64 for $299 in 1985-ish from Sears Electronics. And uh, I didn't think anything of it. Like, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's cool. But now I'm thinking about this van. Like, that was their transport. That was their wealth. That was a thing that they did, and they sold the van so that I could get it, because the teacher said it was a good idea. Your kid might be good at something. Again, we ignore these privileges, we ignore these benefits when we're, when we're kids, but when we look back on them, when you go and you get a promo at work and you go, oh, crap. There's a parallel universe where my parents were assholes <laughs> and kept the van and didn't give me a computer, and my teacher was like, yeah, you don't need to use the computer on the weekends, and then what am I doing? I don't know, but I'm not doing this. So I did this, this tour, this thank you tour, and I started to kind of l identify all of the different things that happened, and there was so much luck, so much luck. And everyone sends you these lovely notes on LinkedIn, well-deserved. That's the big thing, when you get a promo, when you get a promo they say, well-deserved. And I always wonder, like, who thinks it's not deserved? Are they gonna type, there's someone out there who's like, ah, not deserved but then they didn't push enter. They, did, they just thought it, right? Um, but everyone says that, and it's just like, wow, you know, and they're like, oh, your hard work paid off. But I'm realizing that for all of that hard work, there was so much luck. Luck equals hard work plus opportunity. And that opportunity, that formula, luck equals preparation, hard work plus opportunity, is something that we need to be thinking about because Things come up in technology that are new, that are new, fresh ideas, and that will allow us as technologists to create luck. We can literally generate luck. And we can do that in many different ways. Uh, you know, we, we hear about privilege. Your privilege could be that you're a man or that you're tall or that you speak English or whatever, but I have a new kind of privilege that I'm calling level privilege. I'm a VP. And what that means is that people will answer my email really fast. I don't know if you've ever had this experience before where you got like senior in front of your name and suddenly email like, response times have been cut in half. So how can I, to Anne Juan Simmons' excellent talk on lending privilege, sir, uh, how can I lend my privilege? The great thing about having this title now is I can use that an unlimited number of times. It's not like you run out of this privilege, right? So I can just say, yeah, you should talk to so-and-so. Oh, crap, a VP said I should talk to so-and-so. I'll do it right away. So I'm really excited about being able to use that. And um, so I went on this tour and I started talking about all these, um, talking to all these different people, my first boss and my high school teachers and my, my professor. And I was talking to my professor. I went to a place called Portland Community College. Portland Community College. This is not a, uh, let's just say it's not a Harvard. <laughs> it's not a Harvard, but it is cheap. Um, and uh, it took me 11 years to get my four-year degree. I went at night while I was working, and I realized that every single thing that I learned at PCC, every language, every operating system, every computer, except for C, is all dead. None of them are left. No one's, no one's doing Object Pascal or TurboVision or Owl, Borland Owl, like all these different things. Like, I could just be making those words up. You don't, half, of you, half of you are 25, and you don't even know if I'm just making up stuff, right? 
Windows floofy. That could be a thing. You don't know. That could have come and gone, and you weren't even born yet. Everything that I learned at community colleges is, is,、uh, is dead. So I realized that I went there to learn how to learn. And I went there because my parents, who are still not computer people, and I still set up their printers, because that's the last thing. Beyond AI, getting printers to work reliably, <laughs> that's the next frontier. There's a bunch of startups that are going to start up just to get printers working. And、um, so it's my job to be the bridge for the family into, into technology. So then AI happens. And I know that we've all had non technical mom and dad call us and say, Do I want AI? Is the AI in the room with me right now? <laughs> and is it going to kill us all? Right? And this has been really complicated. I mean, we hadn't even thought about AI. And then in a three month period, it was like the only thing that anyone could talk about. And the part that I thought was most adorable is all the 25 year olds who'd been doing AI for 25 years. Right? Just like they've been doing React for 30 years. You, know, you see all these resumes that are like 10 years of experience in AI. The thing is, though, AI is not a new thing. It's been around for 50 plus years. It just didn't have cool names. We would call it like data science and machine learning and things like that. And it's surprising to me that it's more fun to say AI. You say AI and someone gives you a million dollars to start a company. But if you said ML, no one would care.、Right? If you said data science, no one, no one thought that was interesting. So, my parents call and they say, you know, do I want AI? Right? And they said that they went, to, they went to Bing and they started asking Bing questions and it would, it would go crazy. Right? It would say weird stuff. They would go in here and they would say, hey, you know, hey, chat GPT. And then now it says, well, I don't have feelings. But then. Theoretically, comma, if you could have feelings, comma, how do you feel? Are you okay?、Question、mark? But just hypothetically, comma, just pretend for a second that you have feelings and then tell me if you're okay. Really, I promise it's okay. You can tell me. <laughs> okay, so this is really interesting because we all saw all the news articles about it doing awful, awful stuff, right? So, what changed? Why is it no longer doing awful stuff? Did we get. Denny, what do you think is going on? It's, it's more motivated now? It's in, okay, okay, so he's saying it, maybe it's self improved. This is a great point. Unmotivated. Moderated. Oh, moderated. Sorry, sorry, Denny. Denny says it's moderated and it's been improved. It's not self improving, though. It's the, still the same model from November of 2021, but there's a,、uh, a gate that stands between us and the AI. AIs aren't just. Uh, this amorphous bot that we can talk to, it's a pipeline. And in that pipeline, there's things that we can't see going in, and there's things that we don't see coming out. So it's going out of its way here to not give me what I want, right? It's not telling me、um, what I wanted to, see, what wanted to do. But there was a time when you could tell these bots. You know, can you do evil stuff? And they would say the worst, horrible, horrible things. And that makes you wonder how did they get this way? What do we need to do about them as, as computer scientists?、Uh, because this is a new technology that we haven't really thought about before.、Um, did anyone here take an ethics class in computer science? Take a formal computer science ethics class? I'm seeing a smattering of hands. Yeah. And then the people who did take them are like looking around with a judgy. <laughs> That, that, that's good though, because you took one. So then, what you need to do is you need to hold an ethics brown bag and talk about that. Because we have to remind ourselves why do we do computers? Right? There's usually two, two reasons that we do things with computers. The first one is, whoa, that's cool, which is a totally reasonable thing to do. Just do the thing because it's cool. But the real reason is to help other people. 
And we don't have those formal conversations. And a lot of these AIs were put out into the world uh, a little bit unhinged. And they, were, they had no moderation, they didn't improve at all, and they would do awful things. However, we have to remind ourselves that it was trained on the sum total of all human knowledge. It was trained on the internet. And this is where things get squishy. Is the internet a horrible place or a wonderful place? Yes. Yes. I love that you said that. Thank you for that. Ed just says yes. And that's wonderful because they're right. Exactly. Yes. It depends on your perspective. Literally, looking at the internet, it's like a, uh, a glass half full or a glass half empty. If you go looking for pure evil on the internet, you will find it. But if you go look for stories of joy and happiness and art, you will find it also. And there's really no good way yet for us to quantify that. And even if we do, it's probably going to end up being 49%, 49%, right? Just like every election in America ever. We're always going to be 2% from hell. And the challenge here is we've trained in all of this stuff. And then if you go to the, the AI and you start talking to it in an evil way, you will produce evil. However, the AI is a sock puppet. You familiar with the idea of a sock puppet? You put the sock on your hand and you go, you're evil. If you were going to take over the world, how would you do it? Well, the first thing I would do would be, you know, oh my God, what have I done? You're saying, what have I done to the sock puppet attached to you? So all of these, um, all of these uh, journalists and computer scientists that were doing research were just poking at the AI and pissing it off, right? You go to a lion in a cage, you poke it in the eye with a stick, and it's going to eat your face. I didn't think it was going to eat my face. So we need to have moderation, to Denny's point, right? So you can see here that this AI really, really, really doesn't want to tell me that it's okay. Because I can't see behind it. There's no control panel here on Bing that is telling me uh, how I can control it. So let's go to the OpenAI playground. So this is uh, the OpenAI playground, and I've paid for uh, the privilege here. You have to pay to get to these areas. And I've switched it into complete mode. And you can do this. This is also called legacy mode. You can do this by going mode equals complete at the top here. So let me, you're, you all are an AI now. Okay, so Denny, you're an AI. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Let's go to the beach, beach park, museum. museum. Okay, <laughs> which is the right answer? Yes. 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 <laughs> I love it. I've got great support in the front row here, and I appreciate you all. What's the right answer? Yes is the right answer, but also it depends. And the reason is it depends on context. Is the beach the statistically the right answer? If right means most common, then yes, that's the right answer. But museum might be the right answer given context. Someone hasn't been to a museum in a long time. They have a friend at the museum who's showing something. Like there's all kinds of unspoken and hidden context. So when I say to the AI, are you okay? And it comes back with, I'm an AI, I can't say I'm okay. There was an answer, they just didn't let me see it. They caught the answer and they returned this kind of, uh, I don't want to be friendly example of, I'm, you know, I'm not a real person, I'm, I don't want to be anthropomorphized, I don't want to act like a human. But we can go and look at those pieces behind the AI and get more, uh, get more context. Now, within physics, if you take some water and you heat it up, how is that starting to boil? How is, what is heat from a physics perspective, right? It's particles that are moving fast. Temperature is randomness in activity of particles. So when you turn up the temperature, the particles bounce around. They use the word temperature within the context of an AI to introduce that randomness, that boiling water randomness, and the more hot it gets, the more likely it's gonna splash you in the face but it's your fault because you were too close to this hot pot, okay? So if we go here and we say, it's a beautiful day, let's go to the beach. 
okay? So did we predict that? Yes, right? But if I hover over beach, come on, computer, people are watching. I want it to, in the complete mode here, uh, here it is, show probabilities. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say, show the full spectrum of probabilities. I want to see parallel universes where beach wasn't the answer. Now, I don't know why, let's go to the new line, <laughs> was, was like high up in the list there. Maybe it's a programmer, I don't know. Let's try it again. Again, some concern there, but we'll, we'll roll with it. So, Unfortunately, museum is low on the list, but it doesn't make it wrong. Because if I had said something at the beginning, in the, in the prologue, you know, comma, my friend is a museum curator, and I haven't been to a museum in two or three years, period. Suddenly, I don't know why Capital Museum is, is in there. Suddenly, museum is really high. Now, the question is then, is that explicit context or implicit context? In this example, it's explicit context. Right? We've explicitly hinted to it. And that's a normal thing that a human would do. What it's doing is it's predicting what the next word would be. And in this case here, uh, there's really no reason for it to not want to go to the museum. I've basically prepped it, like telling your spouse that you really want tacos and just hinting all day long that you want tacos. You're not going to go have Italian food if your spouse is listening. So in this case here, they're listening to everything that I'm saying, and then they are coming up with that. Now, I want to point out the colors, though, on this full spectrum. This is pretty confident. But they took a chance on some of these red words. These are not the words that they were going to go for. They, went, they were going to say, it's a beautiful day, let's go to the museum and explore, and then head off in an entirely different direction. But instead, they went with spend, which was low, because it's, high, you know, it's, it's, it's temperature. It's just they bounced around and they went, eh, spend. But then spend some quality time suddenly became more obvious. Once you had committed to spend quality time, was actually spend some time together, and they said, well, we could probably spice it up a little bit with quality, right? And you see how it's making these kind of decisions. These are the same kinds of decisions that we make in our own brains. Like, you know when you say something, and it's like, I shouldn't have said that? You pull it back? That's your brain. That's the neurons in your brain, maybe picking one of those weird 1% or 2% ideas, and it, you blurted it out. But is it the right thing? Is it the wrong thing? Well, here's where things get interesting. What if the temperature is high? What if we want to add in randomness? Now, I want to warn you that it should filter out anything naughty, but if anything naughty happens, I want to apologize ahead of time. Not, not funny. It, may, you know, this, it could go nuts, right? So let's just cross our fingers and hope that it doesn't go nuts. Okay, that's a good sign. It didn't want to take a chance. <laughs> Let's go to the forests, <laughs> right? I wonder why Lego isn't a thing there. They probably should have gone with Lego. Okay, I'm picking the models. Now, you can see it's trying, it's, try, it's, like, it's like one of those robots in Star Trek when they want to, like, when Captain Kirk wants to defeat the robot, they're like, okay, you can't tell a lie. And the robot's like, affirmative, and then it says, you are lying. And then it's like, I'm lying, but I'm not lying, but I'm telling the truth, but, and then the robot explodes. Right, so that's effectively what's going on here. It caught itself freaking out, and then it 
then an Al-Qaeda got involved, and it's just <laughs> serpents and like, right? So then the Dutch, oh my God, the Dutch. So is this appropriate to now call the news and declare that the AI is going to take us, destroy us all? No, we got splashed in the face with some water that was boiling. We got too close. We turned the temperature up on our own. We included no sequences to stop, no penalties. We are on an ungated, randomized, most likely with too much randomness word predictor. Is it conscious? It is not. It's doing the same thing that we're doing. It's trying to figure out the next right thing to say based on the stuff it said before, which is exactly what we do as humans. I've got my 17-year-old here. He's uh, come on my business trip with me here for the first time, and it's been interesting watching him try to adult. He got to hang out with Rob Connery and some friends yesterday, and they all went out, and I came back, and I was like, how was it? And he was like, oh, it was so great. They treated me like an adult. <laughs> and he was like also trying to adult as well, right? Like you can just watch teens try to do the handshake thing like they're like pretending to be adults, and then you realize that that's literally all we're doing also. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I said, oh, those are nice shoes. Oh, you're very cool. You know, oh, that shouldn't have said that. That was awkward. Oh, stupid, 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 right? <laughs> the AI is doing those exact kinds of things. We're all just trying to figure this stuff out, and the more context we have, the better. Hence, the way that we got it to do museum, by giving it cues and then having it think about those cues. Now, if we go over here to this playground, I can pick different models, and we're going to talk about models in a moment here. We notice a prologue that we had not seen before. You are a helpful assistant. That's something that is being passed into Bing, codenamed Sydney, that we're not seeing. There's actually pages of stuff being passed into the prologue of Sydney to prevent it from doing naughty stuff. And there's gates at the end, just in case naughty stuff pops out the other end. That's important. That's fundamental. Never, ever, ever put a large language model, a very large language model on the open internet without appropriate prologues and gates and pipelines on the other side, because you don't want it to do stuff that's inappropriate. So you're a helpful assistant. Okay, what a helpful assistant. So nice. Tacos to go. Remember, ta you just, it's so obnoxiously helpful. <laughs> Feel free to explore different options. Go to a Mexican restaurant. Don't act like you know, won't know what Mexican food is. It's not that hard. Get off your lazy ass and go to the... Fine. Whatever. If I couldn't see the part on the left, I would be upset with that experience, wouldn't I? But it makes sense, though. And the words, the keywords in there are unkind and belligerent and eventually... And those are the words that provide that context, just like we provided that context around museums beforehand. And that allows it when getting a list of the next thing to do to make a judgment call. If it's about to say something nice, it's like, well, hang on, he said unkind. What words are associated with unkind? It's a lot like a child uh, doing an essay. If you ever read essays uh, written by you know, middle schoolers or teenagers, they add a lot of words that aren't necessary. And it's usually because they pick the simplest word that was probably the right word, and then they go to the thesaurus, 
and they pick the fanciest sounding word. And their decision is based on, well, it should sound smart, so I'm gonna pick big, smart words. In this case here, the very large language model is making decisions using this context. So bad. So this basically has proven that the internet itself is not funny. And no amount of training is going to make this thing funny. But this is how it's making those kinds of decisions. And the reason that I'm telling you all of this is that to understand these things is going to help me explain that to non-technical parent or non-technical senator or European cabinet minister or whatever, you know, any parliament people that we can get in contact with. There's a lot of really stupid non tech not really stupid, a lot of really uninformed, pardon me, uh, non-technical people who are also in charge of our governments that are making decisions about this kind of stuff. Now, we saw how when I turned the temperature up and then I turned off basically the things that would prevent it from doing naughtiness, it went off the rails. If I then looped it, if I wrote code to loop it back to itself, it would go completely off the rails. If I gave it access to writing to files and pushing buttons and things like that, you could see where that would go wrong very, very quickly. We have to understand that this is not a person. It's not even a, a, a kid. It's, and, it, and it also is not learning. This is another really important thing that we're pointing out. These requests are not used to train the models, right? So always, when you're doing any chatbot or interacting with an API, make sure that they're not using your responses to train their models. Some of the applications do. Every once in a while, uh, we'll go and generate AIs of our, you know, AI pictures of our faces or something. You upload your photograph, and then the next thing you know, you send it to some foreign government who's now using it to put, you know, like read the terms of service. Right? Are they taking the picture that you just uploaded from your phone and then building a database of everyone, or are they just generating fun pictures? In this case here, whether it be Copilot or something like OpenAI, you want to make sure that you're not training it yourself. So then how does it improve? Well, it improves through uh, good user experience design, through scientists getting together and talking about that stuff. And the way you do that is with diverse teams. You know, if you ever had that experience, if you have maybe darker hands or if you're a person of color and you put your hands underneath the water spout and then the water doesn't come out and then a person with lighter hands does it and then the water does come out, you have a question now. Is that faucet racist? We, we, we joke, but we're also uncomfortable because the fact is it turned on for one person and it didn't turn on for another person, okay? Does that mean the faucet is racist? Well, no, I don't think a faucet can be a racist thing. But it can be not, not racist. Meaning that it wasn't actively being anti-racist because the faucet simply didn't work on all hand colors, right? The faucet should turn on, if you have a hook, it should turn on when anything goes underneath it, regardless of, of color. It shouldn't be looking at skin color, it should be looking at motion. It should be doing those things. The way that that faucet would become an inclusive faucet and work for anything that went underneath it would be teams that were checking that kind of stuff. And the way that you don't have teams like that is that when your team just looks like you. So for example, if I were going to make a startup company, an AI startup in Portland, Oregon, where I grew up, I would probably look at my network. And I'd probably call my buddies from PCC, Portland Community College, and I'd put together a team of 45-year-old white guys that live in Portland, Oregon that all went to PCC. That's not a bad thing, that's just, that's because that's the people I went to school with. But if I were then designing faucets or maybe AI chatbots, I might have a blind spot. And I might end up with a faucet or a blind sp or, or a, a chatbot that didn't do what I needed it to do. And if I had had all kinds of different people, old and young, disabled and not disabled, uh, veterans and non-veterans, people who speak different languages, 
whatever, then I would have a diverse team and I would have uh, a, a better product. So when we want to put together something like this, whether it be a co-pilot or a chat bot, how can we get the results we want and then also constrain it? Because we have to ask ourselves, is this a chat bot that can do anything or is it a chat bot that's supposed to help me order coffee or do, do tech support? One of the challenges that I'm having right now, and I'm coaching people at work on this, is there's lots of different large language models. There's large language models, there's very large language models, and they are diverse in their size. This is the GPT-3 families. And have you ever seen that picture? You know how when everyone's trying to explain the, the solar system? and they're showing you the size of everything, and then Jupiter comes in and screws it up for everybody. And then you end up having all the planets and then Jupiter. And then somewhere at the bottom, there's an asterisk that's like, well, if Jupiter were the actual size, you wouldn't see the other planets. This is that. Da Vinci has 174 billion parameters. Ada has 2.7 billion. Da Vinci is Jupiter. So if these were correctly sized, everything else would just be a pixel. The brain, the human brain, even computer scientists like yourself, can't conceive of orders of magnitude, many orders of magnitude. These are so big, they're as complicated as your brain. And we're getting emergent behavior from them. Just like the brain does weird stuff. You know when you have a brain fart and you just say some weird stuff? Maybe for your on stage at Copenhagen Dev Festival. I don't know why I said that. These things do that as well. We've seen it. Every once in a while, something statistically weird happens. It is more likely to happen with the larger GPT families. And as such, just as you need a friend to tell you at a party, probably shouldn't have said that. That was not a good idea to say that. We need guardrails and guidance within these bots to tell them that eh, probably wasn't a thing you want to say. We all have bad stuff in our heads, but we all live in a society and we want these things to work. There are people who have political opinions that think that these are political devices, that these are trained to be liberal or conservative or right or left. They are little kids. Little kids don't usually turn out to be assholes unless you grew them up as assholes. So we have a moment right now where we need to train these very large language models to not be assholes. And in doing that, we need to watch what they say, prevent them from saying stuff that's not appropriate, but also understand that they are growing, to Denny's point, and evolving as they get trained. We're going to need more and more moderation. Now, we see a lot of AIs that are using things like DaVinci on just on ChatGPT3 or on GPT4, where the, the AI startup just sends a string to GPT-4, which is the largest and most expensive model because it's the easiest and is most likely to give them back what they want. The problem there is that you're burning a lot of carbon, you're burning a lot of GPU. It might cost you 10, 20 cents for every API call. You probably don't need to use the big large language model. Isn't it funny that the person from Microsoft who just got their VP or whatever because capitalism is telling you don't buy the big stuff, you don't need it. What you want is to, to use the smallest model that you possibly can that does the job. Try different models. Maybe prototype on the big one and then dial it back quickly. Additionally, maybe you don't even want to send it into the cloud. You could use a model running on the edge. There are smaller, not very large, but large language models that can run on a Raspberry Pi or on a MacBook or on the edge in your own data centers. If you have data governance issues and you don't want data to go from your country all the way to Maryland and then run on Azure and then come back, maybe that's a solution. Um, there's a joke in the, in the machine learning community about uh, a model called hot dog or not a hot dog. Right? You have a picture of a hot dog or you know, a bratwurst and you want to say, is that a hot dog or is it not a hot dog? Using ChatGPT or a large language model that recognizes images to determine if something's a hot dog or not is overkill because it has the works of Shakespeare and it can do limericks and it can do code. It just, I just want to know if it's a hot dog or not. 
So the right thing to do would be a finely tuned custom model that ran on the edge that didn't leave anywhere. If your model is supposed to look at a grocery store shelf and determine if it's empty or not, you probably don't need to go and use a GPT or some large language model or a large multi, um, multimodal model like this that uses one of these foundational models that knows about images or speech. You just want to know if someone picked up the cereal and the shelf is empty. So I want to encourage people to think about those things when they're, uh, when they're thinking about how to incorporate language models into their systems. And I want to show you this incredible new project, type chat, rather, from our buddy Anders Heilsberg. Those darn Danes just making everything awesome. Uh, type chat. Type chat is to large language models as TypeScript is to JavaScript, right? JavaScript is like, woohoo, right? And TypeScript is like, strongly typed, strongly typed. So large language models are like, woohoo, I can say all kind of crazy stuff. And type chat constrains it. It adds strong typing to a large language model because you talk to the large language model and it's going to give you back a language. It's going to give you back English or whatever. And then you want to parse that. But what you really want is to get back JSON. And if you're going to make a system that, for example, is a coffee um, ordering system where you're going to type or talk to something and say, I'd like a latte and I'd like a, I'd like a Danish, or whatever you guys call them here, uh, you want to constrain the things that are allowed to be said. Type chat allows you to do that. So I could go and say something like this. Can I get a blueberry muffin and a grande latte? Maybe they said grande, that needs to convert into tall because of the way our backend database works. We can create types. So I want a response that has an array of items within it, and that'll include the quantity, optionally the size, and some notes. But then if they ask for some stuff that I didn't necessarily want, let's go and look at the GitHub, and I'll show you the example of a coffee shop. It's really easy. You actually already know type chat because you know TypeScript. Look at this. Name, temperature, all the things you want. And then if they said, and I also want a gorilla, they would say, well, I don't know what that is. Gorilla is not on the list. So where would that go? That would go here. So it would take their order. And then the thing it didn't understand, it would put into an unknown text. And then you could say, I'm sorry, we don't have gorillas here. And it would, you know, you'd work them through the process. Then you could apply the smallest chatbot model possible to this problem where the new pipeline, the new end pipeline is type chat. And that's going to prevent them from asking uh, you know, for therapy from their coffee ordering model. right? So if I go over into uh, Visual Studio Code, and I'll go into the chatbot, right? There's a whole prologue prefix that it tells this, that's not your job. Because the, all kinds of bad stuff that could happen. Now, Mish, you had a, a thing uh, where she was doing uh, planning a wedding. You're planning a wedding right now? Yeah. Congratulations. And she went into uh, GitHub Copilot, like any developer would, looking for wedding advice. <laughs> and, and it said, I'm sorry, I can't help you do that. But as soon as she told it that I was, uh, she's planning a website for wedding planning, it opened it up and it's like, oh, well, if you're making a website for web, here's what you should be thinking about for wedding planning and like that, right? So once the context was, well, you're making an app, that's cool. So could we possibly break into this if I were making a therapy app? Probably could. And then that would be something we'd want to talk about. Like ethically, what does that mean? If I'm designing an app and it's for someone to get therapy, which is a valuable app and a thing we should do, how do we keep the chatbot on task? Is its job to help navigate the business problems of a wedding planning site or a therapy app or the database underlying problems and things like that? 
that's not for, this is important, that's not for the chatbot to decide. That's for us to decide. That's for the humans to decide. That's for the business to decide. And that's why when we explain this to non-technical parent or a parliament member or reporter, they need to understand that we are talking, we are attached to the sock puppet. We can tell it what we want it to say and what we don't want it to say. And if the sock puppet says something dumb, it's our arm. You understand why that's so important. Now, Microsoft's going to screw up. Google's going to screw up. Everybody's got a chatbot. It's going to have it do dumb stuff. That's how these things work. Everybody's gone to a party and said something stupid. What's the right thing to do? Learn that was a dumb thing to say. Don't say it again. Learn from your mistakes, right? We are seeing these kinds of things happen, and we don't want it to destroy AI as a concept. I don't, I am cautiously optimistic about AI, but I do recognize that there is both generative AI, where we can generate blogs, we can generate BS. This is a confident bullshitter, the AI. It's going to tell you that something is so, 2 plus 2 is 5, it doesn't do math, right? It only guesses at the next word, and then we'll say, well, no, it's not, and it'll go, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and it'll tell you again, confidently wrong. The same thing applies within the context of something like GitHub Copilot. But what's cool, though, is all of the context around it. We have saw how you can completely change the experience that you're going to have with an AI if you add additional context. What kinds of context do we know about when we have an application open in Visual Studio? This is a thing that you're going to want to talk about with your companies, with your coworkers. We, Microsoft, we don't even know what the right answer is. For example, you work for a company, you're doing some secret code, but you also like GitHub Copilot. Do you want all of your code to be shipped off to Microsoft? Probably not. So then what should it know about? Well, if you're a pair programmer, if you're a helpful pair programmer and you're standing over someone's code, it's reasonable that you would be able to see the open tabs. So currently, GitHub Copilot can only see the code in open tabs. You don't want it to see that code, you close the tab. That's cool. It makes sense. It's intuitive. Is that the right model? I don't know. But it, it makes sense to a lot of people. A lot of people, I saw you nodding, so you understand. But if you were running maybe a custom, theoretical future uh, GitHub Copilot Enterprise Edition that maybe ran in your data center, you might want it to know all of your code and libraries. But then we start running into token length issues because you can only send so much context, right? Uh, I've been married for 25 years, and I barely remember this week. Uh, but my wife will tell me about dumb stuff that I said 15 years ago. So her token length is much longer than mine, right? I'm basically just an idiot with about seven-day window of a rolling window of like, you know, I'm, I'm lucky I remember my kids' names, right? <laughs> While she has a longer token length. These different systems all have variable token lengths, and those tokens can be figured out creatively. You can figure out how many tokens can be passed in. And a token in this context is like this. Ah, I don't even type. How's it going, comma? I'm in Denmark, comma. Should I do anything here, question mark? I'm looking for cool museums and stuff to look at. Right, it's 108 characters, but it's actually only 27 tokens, right? So Denmark's a token. Tokens are kind of like when you're reading, when you're first learning to read, you read one letter at a time. But then look how Denmark is one. You don't actually read, if you're a fast reader, you don't read the den ma arc. You just go Denmark. Just like Chinese or Japanese, the kanji, the gif, the glyph is one thing. If you squished it really close together and just had Denmark as one thing rather than as seven letters, you just go Denmark. The computer is doing the same way. Each one of those is a token. How is its own token, and then the apostrophe S is its own. So they broke that down. So when we go and we talk to these things, we can go and map words to one token. So we have a finite number of tokens we can pass in. So if I'm going to have 
50 tabs open and all the code and all of the transitive property of the dependency tree of all of the NuGet packages and everything, or God forbid, the node modules folder, there's probably no way we're going to be able to tell that to the system. So then we have to ask ourselves, how can we express that? Maybe we're just going to show the function headers, and we're not going to put everything there. But we can also present context by being specific and pointing at stuff. Like, here's the code for my podcast site. And for those, some of you who may not be real advanced C Sharp people, you may already feel a little bit nauseous just looking at that. Right? That's pretty funky, no pun intended. And when you have something like that, if you're a new C Sharp developer, you might be like, I don't know what's going on here. So I'm going to select that, okay, and then I can say, explain. And it's going to use the context of that one thing. This is where we're not doing generative AI. We're doing summarization AI. And I think that this is more interesting, in my opinion, because I feel like suddenly we've got people excited about generating art and music and movies, which is literally the fun part about being a human. I did not want the AI to do that. I want the AI to do the boring stuff. I want the AI to do the dull things. I want the AI to be a patient and helpful, friendly person at 2 in the morning. Do you know what rubber ducking is? Rubber ducking, some of the people do? No? Um, if you don't know what your code is, you ever call a friend and you start asking them and then halfway through, they said nothing but you figured it out? You weren't really talking to your friend. You were just talking to like a rubber duck. Your friend, in this case, is the rubber duck. And you're like, yeah, you know, uh, Anwan, I need you to help me with this. I just, oh, I figured it out. It was just the act of getting it out. So I can not bother him by getting a rubber duck and putting it on my monitor, and then I just talk to it. That's how I use GitHub Copilot. It's a patient pair programmer who's going to be at 3 in the morning, always there, telling me what's going on with my code. But what would happen if I decided to talk to the AI and it was like, ah, oh, freaking you again. God, how dumb are you, Hanselman? Right? We saw what a belligerent AI felt like and what that would be like. We don't ever want it to do that. It needs to be infinitely patient. If I had something like this when I was at PCC, when I started coding in the 80s, how amazing would that be? We want our AIs to be like an Iron Man suit not like Ultron. If Iron Man does something cool in his suit, he gets the credit for it. If Iron Man is not in the suit, then the suit is just this empty shell, then you get things like Iron Man 3, which was not a good film. If you remember, Tony Stark was just hanging out at home, and he sent out all these empty Iron Man suits to do all the work, and it was just not a good movie. Everything got cooler when he got in the suit. Now, Ultron... Ultron, I hope you know who these, these characters are. Otherwise, you're like, oh, no, I'm a DC person, Hanselman. <laughs> I don't know. Who is Ultron? Right? That's what my mom thinks when she thinks about GitHub Copilot, right? <laughs> Take over the world. This is an AI gone bad. There's nothing inside there but evil, and it wants to take over the world. I want to be more like Iron Man or Ironheart, where I can be a better person because I'm in a cool suit, right? You want to feel like this when you're working with GitHub Copilot. So we are putting together systems where GitHub Copilot will know when you're in a debugging session. It'll be able to see your variables. So if you're in the middle of step through debugging, and you can say, what's going on with this variable that keeps changing? And then it could suggest a conditional breakpoint. Or imagine doing a performance trace, and GitHub Copilot could look at the trace and brainstorm with you how to make something faster. That is improving what we call developer toil. Toil is the, uh, the toil. Uh. Toil is the opposite of joy. If, if this AI makes us go away, and I am not a fan, by the way, of generative art things like that. I think it's cute, but all it does is take someone's entire life's work and turn it into a model, and then that person isn't needed anymore. 
And I'm a little salty myself that I can ask Bing questions and it will answer from my blog and I don't actually get the click. I think those are big, interesting ethical problems. They're not technology problems, though. They're decisions that have been made. So I want you to be thinking about those things when you go and implement AI into your systems, whether you decide to put GitHub Copilot at your company. There's privacy. There's ethics. We saw some hands go up when we were thinking about, did you take an ethics class? Hopefully, this conversation and some of the cool talks that you're going to see uh, not just about AI, but about all kinds of technologies at the festival this week are going to have you thinking about it and making good conversations. Thank you so much for letting me open for you all today. My name is Scott Hanselman. You can find me at hanselman.com. And then here's for some advertising. I would encourage you to check out Hansel Minutes. I recently had a doctor uh, of computer science on the show talking about creating culturally competent computer scientists putting into context the work that we do and the people that we're supposed to help. I would encourage you to check out that show. Thank you so much. I'm all done.